All right. Good evening, ladies and gentle hobbits. Welcome to Torn Tuesday. The chat room is already active and my door is open again. My name's Justin, and this is my lower third. We are old school here at Torn. We like to make our things out of real paper and cardboard, unlike those other websites that use digital graphics with fancy animations and and uh, everything like that. I see Kevington is on Twitch, and Imran is on Facebook, and Nigel, and Jimmy's on YouTube, and we got people watching on Twitter, X, and Discord as well. This is Torn Tuesday. He does of all things Lord of the Rings. And I don't do this show alone because I am not as versed in Tolkien lore as your host with most, Mr. Clifford Broadway. Well, hello there. Hello, everybody. Hi. Good afternoon. Gosh, what a beautiful group of people assembled here for another Torn Tuesday. Hey, you know, Justin, you're not the only one who saved your title card there from WonderCon. That was a really great experience we had. We have to tell everyone about the WonderCon uh, a little bit and some front leading news, uh, maybe a couple of bits. And then we're going to talk about the semifinals leading into the final finals of our Middle Earth March Madness, which now has to conclude in April. I know it's April now and welcome aboard. Everybody, springtime is here and you are in the right spot to be with us for the OneRing.net Torn Tuesday. It is so good to have everyone here. And wait, there's, look at, look who's in the chat. There's Otaku Senpai, there's Susan and Jimmy, Nigel, and hey, it's Jen, Jen Bourgeois. I love it. Good times. All everybody. our wonderful people. Well, this weekend we yeah, uh, spent, we spent Easter with you the fans at WonderCon Anaheim and it was just a wonderful thing and I you know I should Indeed. read some of the stuff that's on the back of the placard you see everybody's <laughs> name with, uh, on the table on these panels oh, yeah. and it says uh WonderCon is part of the Comic-Con family of conventions and it says San Diego Comic Convention Comic-Con International is a California nonprofit public benefit corporation oh, organized for okay. charitable purpose charitable purposes and dedicated to creating the general public's awareness and appreciation of and for comics and related popular art forms that is their charter and this is why we like going to comic-con and WonderCon and all the cons around the country because most of them are charitable events like this and that's why they exist. It's spread the word and spread the love for uh, for the popular arts. Indeed. And we, we had a wonderful crowd with us today, and we had some stuff that we cannot share online. We told you guys there's only stuff that we're willing to say in public, one-on-one, friend-to-friend, face-to-face, that we That's can't right. post online. So that was a you wonderful get the exclusive. Show. You get the exclusive con experience when you attend one of these conventions. That's how we explain it. That's that's how it works. So it but was Cliff- a lovely crowd at our big panel presentation, and we had Christy uh, from Tolkien Forever, and we also had uh, other staff members, Kathy, Nicole, and Nicole, the, Nicole joined us as well. The, Sa- the, 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 the famous Sauron meme: uh, "Dress for the job you want." If you look it yes. up, Sauron dress for the job you want mean. That's that's Torn Staffer and Friend. And of course, everything was yes. organized and managed by uh Kathy, who will be joining us in a few minutes on the show as we go into the final four. But before that, we got a couple hints of news in the Tolkien hmm. world, starting with I didn't know Ooh. if you know this, but just like Comic Con and WonderCon are charitable organizations. The one ring.net is a charitable organization. We are not for profit. We always have been true. Uh, true. No one at the one ring makes a penny. Uh, we pay our own way. When we go to all these conventions, we paid uh-huh. for the gas, we paid for the parking. Uh, and we're happy to do it because we're spreading the gospel of Tolkien. And so Indeed. just like these conventions are charitable, charitable, the Wondering.net has don- donated on a yearly basis for over 20 years 
to the New Zealand Duffy Books in Homes mm -hmm. Charitable Foundation. This is their website right here. Uh, we have proudly um, participated in a lot of their uh, outreach and endeavors. Um, their, this whole thing is a chair. It, it's a book charity in New Zealand. And their whole thing is just getting books in the hands of kids. Help us build better communities through books. It's real simple. And it makes sense for a Tolkien fan site uh, to participate in, Indeed. in a book charity. Don't you think, Cliff? I do agree. And I would also uh, remind folks that in years past, before uh, Duffy, uh, one of our previous beneficiaries, I mean, when, when we were selling ads, and when we did make any revenue off of ad sales, we donated our money to the World Literacy Fund. That was like, you know, a couple of decades ago. This is our new beneficiary that we work with, uh, Duffy. And it is so cool that as a volunteer community organization, we have a chance in some small way to give back to the efforts at literacy and bringing books. That's right. It's always the focus is to bringing books into the hands of the little kids and opening their minds so they can learn and read, and grow in, you know, and uh, experience the world through the wonderful pages of early literacy. That's what it's That's all right. about. And, 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 and you so know what? I, Polish off your shiny local library card. And by the way, support your local library. There you go. PSA and uh, so, I, I, you know, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that Torn is nonprofit, always has been. Our website does not have any ads on it. You don't see a lot of sponsored posts from us either. This show is free. We try to keep the ads off the live stream. Sometimes we can't because uh, YouTube is going to mm -hmm. do what YouTube does. But right. that's what we get for using a free service. So, uh, but as a charity, you know, we help support books in the hands of kids. And we got an update uh, we, we got an update this week. Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, yesterday, that Duffy, um, who part of their charitable outreach is they put on um, they put on assemblies at school. Mm -hmm. You guys remember re remember those when, huh. you know, you'd get out of class for a few hours and you have to go to the school assembly and it was about a certain topic. Well, Duffy does uh, uh, assemblies at schools all around New Zealand um, to encourage books and writing and, and, and new thought. Uh, and of course, they are focused on uh, in increasing the literacy of, of uh, uh, minority groups in New Zealand. And so they, were, uh, they sent us a note uh, yesterday that mm. uh, they have new uh, elementary school assembly speakers They'll be touring around uh, for the rest of the school year. Xavier Breed here is a proud Aotearoa New Zealand-born Samoan. Mm. Currently uh, hey, in Auckland. A is it Aotearoa? Something yeah. Like that. That's better. And uh, 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 Xavier is currently the coordinator for Village Collective, a project aimed at addressing social I isolation for Pacific Matua older people that's uh mm -hmm. that, that, that's the kiwi word for older people um through activities and engagement focused on intergenerational knowledge transfer so wonderful wonderful uh speaker there and then the second speaker that that they announced um is jasmine here and uh she is new zealand born uh from tonga and a graduate tertiary dance teacher, researcher, and creative. Um, so she is undertaking a PhD in dance studies at Waipapa Tamata Rao University in Auckland. So wonderful, wonderful uh, updates from the charities that you support by being here and part of Torn. You know, every Absolutely. every little penny. Every little penny that comes in from Google ads and YouTube ads that gets deposited and torn every six months, and where it's fractions of a penny for those ads uh, that we don't control, uh, goes to uh, reading charities like this. So thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you, everyone, for Absolutely. 
being a part of this. Yeah. Uh, That's and great. then a couple Thank other, uh, and then, and then a couple other things before, uh, before we go on cliff, I think we need to mention this again. Please. WonderCon and Comic-Con are nonprofits and they're here to share in the knowledge and wealth of the art form of pop culture. And we just said, and we just showed you that, that or, we or rather been, the multitude, the multitude of art forms that are employed in popular culture, perhaps. Yeah. So it was kind of, we thought it was funny. Yesterday's April 1st joke. <laughs> this, this because <laughs> Tor, Tor, Torn is famous for our April Fool's jokes. One year we posted that uh, Disney was buying Middle Earth Enterprises and everybody flipped out. Do you know what? Hands were thrown. I'm serious. When we did that April Fool that one year, there were a lot of hands thrown up in the air. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, I remember so, it so, so well. We, we just have we have a lot of fun coming up with, and and the whole staff likes to talk about different ideas for our annual April Fool's joke, you know. And but I think the world has just in a different mood this year, outside of our <laughs> control. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's from maybe it's from a dearth of uh, or, or a lack of anything official from any studio about anything Lord of the Rings. But we posted this Middle Earth on Wheels, the ultimate food truck experience, and posted a mock up of our new gosh. food truck. That is the it, most AI thing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. That is the most and AI thing I've ever seen. In an unexpected journey that rivals well, Bilbo's almost. own, the Wandering.net is thrilled to announce the launch of its very own food truck, bringing the flavors of Middle Earth to the world. Well, oh, wow. a portion of the world. And wow. we, we had pictures of the whole menu. I mean, oh, no. just look at that M on hen and the artisanal <laughs> breads That's and the no, one-yen ring and the Isengard unquiched and the salmon <laughs> Frodo. Look at that really? salmon Frodo. Isn't that delicious? It's really hilarious. Uh, but folks, when you... Cliff, uh, That's just nuts. what happened after we posted this yesterday, Cliff? Uh, what happened after we posted this? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, uh, aside from, you know, uh, Twitter being Twitter <laughs> and just responding the way it would, um, there was uh, what what did happen? Was was there? It was exactly was that there, the social did, did, social media did not take kind no, to this I'm sure artwork. The, but the Simpsons it, mob came marching with their torches, like total Simpsons mob style came running for but the, I, I think just, part of the joke is the ai being employed this way that's obviously it's, it's obviously, obviously part of the joke. we didn't right. yeah we're not trying to hide our use of ai here folks, not at, all, at all not at all but, like the it's joke obvious. is the bad ai it's as bad as a bad photoshop right yes that's the joke that's exactly the the reason why the first thing i think of is good gosh this is so glaring and so funny i mean it's very tongue-in-cheek and it's well, perhaps it's a bit of a statement on the, uh, the the aptitude for people to have media literacy and be able to perceive the nuance of a joke when they're presented with something that is a more nuanced joke. But and at least that's the state of affairs, that some people react to that way. But I think it's an obvious and very funny joke, actually. Well, <laughs> and, and, and as social media does, the social media algorithms <laughs> do not reward positivity and support. They oh, reward no. negativity and oh, criticism. Dear. And so uh, I, I don't know what to say. This is an April Fool's joke. It's meant to be a joke. Very much. Uh, it's clearly so. like, we're, you know, we're using AI to touch on all of the, 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 the crazy things that are happening in this world. Food trucks, <laughs> Middle Earth food. Like exploitation of of Lord of the Rings things and come on, like this is just it, it's just for silly fun and I don't know it like it turned it rather than reading the article and appreciating the joke it the social media just turned this into you know how uh, dare you I'm use AI how dare you use AI and you know what we 
we've had many artists on this show, Cliff. We are many friends times, with yeah. artists. We saw Colleen Duran and several Tolkien artists at WonderCon this weekend. Mm-hmm. Like, we know the debate. We know people that are professional artists that could be affected by this. But at the end of the day, AI is a tool that everybody is playing with right now and trying to find what I, what works and what doesn't. I mean, of course. I mean, there shouldn't be any time wasted in trying to defend the obviousness of this joke. Um, if the use of... There would be no other time that the OneRing.net would use AI artwork and imagery unless it was in this capacity i think you know to, 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 can't you can't you see through the joke folks but um anyways um i, I gotta you say, know i'm using i'm using ai <laughs> to clean up my audio right now so you don't hear the very loud uh heaters and air conditioners and fans blowing like you would never know like there's so many uses of ai so we all just i feel like we all just need to take a breath appreciate a joke for what it is we're not trying to pass this off as real artwork unlike not some instagram all. accounts and some facebook pages that are constantly trying to get you to follow their lord of the rings fan page and have it is ai stuff that starts to look real and is obviously a rip off of some artists we're not trying to rip off any artists by the way as i just said before cliff <laughs> torn is not prof non-profit none yes. of us make money with all of the time that we spend on Torn helping the community be a strong community. So there is no budget. There's no money to pay an artist to make stuff. We make do with what we have. If you're an artist and you would like to contribute your time and skills so we don't have to use AI artwork, Uh, please raise your hand. Of course. Slide into our DMs. Slide into (laughs) Cliff's DMs. Hit us up on Instagram and say, hey, Hey, everybody, I've got some time. I'll tell you what, we'd love to have, you know, staff artists who just wanted to regularly contribute things for the website. But this joke was built to be as visually elaborate as the verbiage in the text was to drive home the play on words, the ridiculous cuisine that was being presented. And that cuisine would look way more ridiculous with these weird, hyper realistic and weirdly overly overly color saturated ai images which is just glaring as can be thank you all for being in on the joke with us and i'm sorry that there's people unfollowing us over this but it's april fools and you know more fool you i guess i guess that's the bottom line we're not we're we're not we're not ignoring the debate we're not ignoring the debate we and we we fully understand but you see what the debate is if i mean There is no danger in our stance on generative AI replacing really good and worthy, amazing, creative human artists. There's no confusion about our position on that. I mean, editorially speaking, and as an organization for the Tolkien community, the OneRing.net has no mystery. There's no strange mystery about what our position is on the the threat and the the legal and ethical problems with existing artists having their stuff, you know, turned into cream corn by AI, Gen AI. So and no, and and we didn't no question and, and about our we, position on that really. And nothing Thanks. in these images you know. uh, uses <laughs> artwork uh, stolen from other people. That's like right. we didn't say draw a food truck in the style of John Howe or Alan Lee or the brothers Hildebrandt or Ralph Bakshi. Like we're, we're, there's there's decent uses for this stuff, and I think we just need to take a step back and just just uh, take a breather when it's a <laughs> take joke. A breather. Yeah, <laughs> when it's a joke, it's a joke. But Cliff, oh, honey, let, let's remind. Let, uh, so I want to remind everybody what AI is actually being used for. And that's for replacing voice actors in video dubs. In that's fact, terrible. Amazon, that's we terrible. confirm right now as I scroll down this page, oh, look, there's Amazon's logo. Amazon is using AI video dubbing services to replace AI, uh, to replace real voice actors in their global translations of their, uh, of their global content. There goes my job. There, there goes a big branch of what is 
very useful and utilitarian for voiceover actors who are just getting started out. And there goes a massive chunk of the labor that would be available for voiceover actors who are just struggling and trying to get trying to get there, trying to get these jobs, trying to get their so foot Cliff, in the door. Yeah, Cliff, you just so, you, you just wow. you you just spent a few minutes uh, laughing at and justifying our use of AI, and now here is a here is an AI that is replacing your job specifically. How about, that? How, about How do that? you feel? There's no small amount of irony, obviously. I mean, you can have a laugh about an April Fool's joke because that joke was built around the zeitgeist of how passionate and polarized people feel about gen ai replacing real artists so okay well-timed joke but this is the flip side okay where ai having an impact on matters of human industry is meant to make things easier and cheaper for the businesses who are trying to get something done. Well, it is easier and cheaper to hire a human being such as myself or any of my voiceover compatriots. And it's a lot cheaper just to hire them and let them have the skills, the experience and the, you know, the, the chance to do it versus how much energy you're wasting on all those servers burning and burning all that, you know, fuel to generate some fake voices. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I mean, look at look at this. Here's their sample video. Oh no. The reason I want to show you that is that they're not they're not only replacing the voice actors that would normally get paid for this work they're using AI to replicate your voice but they're using AI to animate your voice your your mouth they're using AI to animate automatically animate your mouth in the new language that you're speaking hmm. yeah, which that means great. isn't that lovely which and look Cliff uh we we, I, I think I've said on the show, I, uh, I'm not, I'm not the biggest proponent. I'm not telling everybody to use AI, but I feel like it's not going away. So I need to, I need to figure out good uses for it. Imagine, um, right? Imagine, right. imagine shows and episodes and scenes and movies of Lord of the Rings that are translated into Sindarin. Using AI, you can watch an entire episode in the Elvish language, the original native tongue of elves. Is that cool? And the mouth syncs up. The voices sound like the actors, and the mouth syncs up. Do you think that's a good use of AI to watch to watch everything in, in Casa Doom and in Moria with the dwarves be, be told in in the language of the dwarves as Tolkien created? I mean, only for only for novelty's sake, but Tolkien, no, necessarily. I mean, and I'm with all the people in the chat room on this because Tolkien bothered with the conceit, the absolute literary genius that he was, the conceit of taking a story that was originally in Kuzdul or Sindarin or Quenya or Westron and can, you know, him translating it or presenting it to us in today's English, 20th century English. So, and that's part of the amazing charm and a greater part of the success is that the literature feels like you're, you know, getting a sneak translation into something that is much, much older and would have been entirely in a different language. But the magic of what Tolkien did was to present it in 20th century English with all of his powers. Are you saying he modernized his myths for a modern audience? No, there was the conceit that maybe the Red Book of Westmarch was a real historical object. And if somebody found the book that Bilbo and Frodo and in the later chapters, Sam would have written as an account of the hobbits 
and their experiences in Middle Earth at the end of the Third Age. The, the conceit is that if that old red book of Westmarch was found, then Tolkien would have been the master scholar who translated it for us into English, while leaving intact lots of Elvish and Kuzdul and other bits of languages in there for the for the essence of it. And you get it? I mean, nah. I mean, really? Right. Why? Well, why? Just why? Why do that? I just why? think I mean, it'd be. Can... I just think it'd be cool. But but uh, yeah. So you know, I think I think AI should be used to help predict weather patterns. Uh, so that we could protect ourselves from things that are happening uh, around the earth as, as uh, the dangerous, you know, climate changes and waves of environmental patterns. Oh, yeah. Now, now we're scales. getting way off topic. But there's yeah, a couple. Hey, no, uh, the, the, AI can do other computations and other things in that larger scale. Atmospheric studies, even traffic, traffic yeah, and where, data, data. Yeah, now we're getting studies. way off topic. Uh, all I, uh, all I have to say is there's but two examples of AI asked. that are good <laughs> and bad, but it's not going away. That's the whole point. It's not yeah. going away. But real, before it. we get to Middle Earth March Madness, real quick, um, <laughs> this this week is this week is CinemaCon in Las Vegas. Will there be uh, an industry only preview of Rohirrim this week? We have our spies, and we'll no. report on that next week. Really? And if people want to know An early when preview? the next trailer will be for that other Lord of the Rings thing. And here it is. More video streamers will have presentation during the TV upfronts. The TV upfronts are now a streamer's uh, advertising industry uh, demo. It's kind of like CinemaCon mm -hmm. for for TV streaming. If that's and, true. And here we go. It says Amazon announced they will be participating in this year's Upfront Week, which is Tuesday, May fourteenth. the The uh, event will be held at Pier Thirty Six in New York. Mm. If there's any time that we are going to see a teaser trailer for season two of Amazon Show, it will probably be Tuesday, May fourteenth. This is probably longer than anybody expects but so i this is our prediction we are six weeks away from a trailer for rings of power season two and we are possibly one week away from the cinema con uh, uh description of whatever rohirrim will be showing cinema con is famous in the Tolkien, you know, pop culture circle for that first time reveal of high frame rate, 48 frames per second, when when nobody on Earth yet, except for the post-production team working with Peter Jackson in New Zealand, but nobody else had seen what The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, would look like in 48 frames per second. And so... Uh, and you still that. can't watch it because they haven't released it on home video or any they digital streaming service in not. high frame rate. So it yeah. was one and done, a flash bang in the world, and it no it longer was, exists. It's but it abandoned was, it was, content. It was cinema scan. It was the moment when cinema exhibitors, the theater chain owners, had the first chance to look at that. And so it's very spot on to think that War of the Rohirrim will have its first reveal in front of all the exhibitors and theater owners at this year's CinemaCon. That is a that is a very good bet. That's the safest bet you could make in Las Vegas today. It's Speaking true. of reveals, true. we've revealed our panelists for Middle Earth March Madness. Hello, Matt I. Gamgee and Dr. Hey, Mao. Hey, everybody. Yeah. Can hey. you guys hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Can, can, I, can I say a word about art? So, yes. We were yes. Talking about, let me let, let me yeah, give you the floor. And, it, and it's a transition to what we're doing with Middle Earth March Madness. Twenty percent of our field, our sixty-four team field, were not movie connected this year, um, and so we tried to come up, especially on the voting pages, with art that was appropriate and helped to illustrate and and uh, spark the imaginations, or at least the memories, of the folks that were voting, so they'd know what they were voting for. Um, in doing that, it was actually a lot of fun, a lot of work to find initially 64 different art pieces. Yeah. Um, many of them came from movie stills, um, but there were a lot of art pieces, even in what we'll reveal today, that were, that were coming from artists, not AI, artists, in some cases, if you've ever tried to do research on the internet, 
define who the um, the actual artist is for various pieces. It can be very challenging because people grab that art all the time. It's not AI, it's just grabbed art. But to illustrate, none of our art is not is unattributed. We always, we won't publish it unless we can uh, identify the artist who is associated with a particular piece. And that's actually so that fans like are watching now go find that artist go buy their stuff because there are incredible artists all over the world that are illustrating tolkien stuff john howe mm -hmm. and uh, uh and others are are terrific but um there are wonderful artists that don't get a lot of attention and popularity and and we've tried to showcase some of them all throughout this tournament so I'll get off. I agree. Side. And, 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 you know, <laughs> we, this is an ongoing discussion too. And I think we, we talked about this uh, several months ago when there was a little, the little hubbub around uh, Tolkien gateway, one of the best resources on the internet for it's a Wikipedia for everything in middle earth legendarium. And they were using AI in an experiment in a test phase to create images for pages of the legendarium that had no artist uh, depictions like no one's ever drawn the thinking fox you know and stuff like that so they were using ai i think that's a good use of it many yeah. people disagree with it and i don't know there's there's a use for it sometimes but when you don't have to then you don't you know yeah yeah true, true. all yeah, right jim you want to uh make well, a quick before, mention of um, we... like uh, just a quick mention of daniel govar who is, uh, you know, the guy who did the wonderful book covers for our paperback publications, The People's Guide to J.R.R. Tolkien. And at that time, the OneRing.net, all those years ago, was actually dedicated to supporting independent, up-and-coming Tolkien artists. We and, still do that. Yeah, Jim's absolutely. point is we yeah. still support that. I still so, do. What were From you going to say, time, Kathy? I, I was just going to say, as a little wrap-up to WonderCon, um, I didn't make it to the um, the masquerade. I was a little tired, and I just wanted to chill. But there was an entire 14-person Middle Earth group, and they actually won the grand prize. Um, and they had everything wow. from a golem. Um, they even had the made-up elf from The Hobbit. Um, 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 Tariel. Tariel. Um, yeah, so I ran into that. They, they also had a... Um, Baradur Tower. So, and the and the guy was walking around on, on Sunday wearing it was like a big huge helm on his head that was the top of Orthanc with you know the eye and I and it had electronics so that the the eye would light up um, and a very tall Galadriel, um, some small little hobbits and it was adorable to see the few that I did see but it was a whole group of fourteen and they did a whole skit. And so at some point in time, um, Justin, you might want to look around um, to see if there are videos from the masquerade this weekend. And if you can find their performance, that might be something you want to look up for future um, things. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, and, I'm and, trying to find it right now. <laughs> yeah. And while talking with them, the thing that was really interesting when I mentioned our panel was people didn't know we were even there. Um, so I'm thinking for Comic-Con, we're shortening our name. And it's going to be very clear. It's Lord of the Ring or it's Tolkien. And we're making the names of our panels very small and easy and obvious what they're about. So that people <laughs> yeah, can if find you, them. You guys, you guys send, send us a link if you can find this uh, masquerade group. Because uh, now I want to see this. Man, I, I, I missed it and I was actually there. All right, moving on. <laughs> um, Jim, uh, let's set this up. Uh, Middle Earth March Madness, where are we at? Yeah, so we're we're we've just wrapped up, and we're announcing on this show um, our regional matchups. So by the end of this, we're going to know who our final four are. So we've got down to the last two in each one of our regions. Those regions we have defined by the three by the four books: Hobbit, Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers, and the Return of the King. And for the purists, you know that Tolkien didn't think of them as three books. It was one book. So, But those are our four regions. And, um, and we've got some really mighty matchups. Um, it, it, before the whole tournament began, our torn staff actually did some rankings or some seedings. And those with a 
few exceptions are turning out to be fairly durable uh, with high seeds actually making it deep into the tournament. Although we nice. do have some low seeded ones, you could argue whether they should have been as low as they were. But uh, that, that's where we are. We're down to our elite eight, our final eight, um, and, and we're going to reveal them. All right. Well, you and, can only uh, have so many in so many positions. So everyone's ranking was just, you know, yeah. mine was yeah. this way and this person's was this way. And you, you, there's only so many spots you can put them on. So obviously, and again, the, yeah. the, this year's theme was magical moments. So magical uh, moments. everything is, is a piece of magic. Sometimes it's hard magic. Sometimes yeah. it's soft magic. But it's all magic that we that you see in middle earth now i've i've argued that some of these things were not magic but that's part of the fun and the debate indeed so there was our we called them our einar or the eldar and cinder eight um the, the finalists in each region we'll see better pictures coming up as you can see we had 114 c but it's the rohirrim arriving on the pillar fields so our hobbit semifinals. no well, that's uh is that an old one justin because uh, I, I think this is one I downloaded today. Okay, well, keep keep rolling. Let's see what we got here. All right. Okay, yeah. yes. Here we go. Hobbit Regional Finals. This was a 1-2 matchup. So we have the Moon Runes. I don't know if you ever – did you ever warm up to the idea that this was really magical, Justin? Moon I runes. did, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't believe that the magic keyhole – I think that was just as magical as Stonehenge. But this is magic. I really like the idea of, of the moonlight uh, reflecting on some some secret ink that the elves have developed. So and it's not just uh, any moonlight. It, it had to be the same moon on the same day appearing it. So the, the whole Yeah, the phase of the moon. Yeah. yeah, the phase of the moon had to be in the right spot. Yeah, and yeah. it's the same time every year. It's not like the eclipse that's happening here in the U.S. next Monday, right. where that's one Which every I'm sixty gonna years. See, I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see it. Where you? Oh, that's a that's a that's an off track thing too. I'm yeah. <laughs> All right. Let, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so the winner of those two, uh, the the one ring actually has made it to the final four. Build a wow. ring of invisibility. Wow. It is still veiled in its power. All we know, and for that matter, all Tolkien knew when he wrote The Hobbit was it just is a powerful ring and it makes us wear invisible. But this is one of the things that I did. I said wasn't really magic because he's not using the ring. He's just finding it. But you guys had a better explanation of why his discovery and possession of the ring is in right. itself magic. The ring has a will, and it's trying to get back to Sauron. And so it calls out to beings. Because Gollum was staying put. Gollum went and hid in the mountains, and he was there for hundreds of years. So it was never going to get back to Sauron if it stayed with Gollum. So it left Gollum. It slipped off his finger, just like it did with Elendil. And, or not Elendil. Um, Isildur. Not wait. Right. Which one did it do? It to? Isildur, right? No. Isildur, the one who claimed it and didn't give it back. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so, um, and so then it looked for somebody who was clearly from the outside and went with him. Of well, course, you know, the it's... hobbits were just, uh, he was just a little bit more in, immured to it. Um, so it, there, it, well, it, not... there, there yeah. are a couple of quotes from Gandalf. One that, that uh, ties in with what Kathy says. Remember in the movie, he says, the ring wants to be found. And so the, the, there is life in the ring itself. But then that Galadriel prologue, then something happened that the ring did not intend. Or Gandalf saying, there are forces in this world beyond just the forces of evil. And so inherent in the finding and inherent in the ring are all of these more cosmic forces that are part of the great music of the Einar uh, that Tolkien wrote about back in the Silmarillion. And it's all coming to focus in this one little ring. Do you, got, do you want to respond to uh, T.D. Matthew right here who says, I never really got that explanation. If the ring wanted to get back to Sauron, wouldn't an orc have been a better choice? Unless an orc is going to go running off and try to claim it for himself. You see, the ring is very corruptive. 
The fact that, I mean, Tolkien even says, the fact that it was being carried by a hobbit was the only way that it got to Mordor at all. That's because right. Because if it was any more powerful of a character, the ring would have consumed them to the point where, yeah, like this Mordor, I'd claim yeah. it myself. Or I'm going to say, I'm not going to let the ring get in 100 leagues of your city. He was wise. Yeah, Gladril refuses it. Or, yeah. um, um, Aragorn refuses it. Gandalf refuses it because they but, know what it would do to them if if they were to put it on. So, but even in that story, Tolkien even confessed in one of his letters that it was a failed quest from the beginning. Uh, and that's a there's a great Stephen Colbert act between his acts where he's saying. Frodo was never going to be able to throw that ring into the fire. He couldn't even throw it into his own fire back in Hobbiton. How would Gandalf think that he's going to be able to throw it into the fires of Mount Doom? And then he says, I've done more thinking than Gandalf about this. So that was a failed project. Only providence, only this combination of circumstances, which you could call magic or providence or fate or karma, whatever you want, mm -hmm. is going to lead to the ultimate conclusion and the melting down of that ring, but it was I'm coming confused. together in Bilbo finding it. So I'm I'm confused. Is Bilbo finding the ring Sauron's magic? Is it the evil magic trying to escape its clutches Not from Bilbo. Gollum, or is it a is it Eru's the good magic putting it in the hands of Bilbo for safekeeping? What what magic is is it good or bad magic at play here? Yeah. It's kind of like T.D. Matthew brought out the point here. It feels like an orc would have been a better idea, which is probably right if Sauron yeah. were in control. I'm going to give it to an orc. He's going to mess it up, and Sauron's going to know it's been found, and the orc mm -hmm. is dead, and here we go. We got it. Um, so, but, Cliff, I mean, yeah. Cliff, do you have an opinion? Is this Sauron's magic or mm -hmm. Eru's magic? That this is this is good or bad that he's finding it? This is the strange dance of both things happening at once. The ring itself being the greatest horcrux of all time. You know, she stole that idea from Tolkien. But oh, the yeah. ring having a sentience, as Kathy very adroitly has mentioned before, the ring having its own evil, evil will exerted upon Gollum kept Gollum from ever wanting to give it up. Gollum was addicted to it, and he would never, ever give it up. And so it was at a point of stasis under the mountains for hundreds of years that's the evil magic the good magic that came in to blend and overlap with the strangest mixture of conditions was that bilbo was a viable vessel for the ring to get itself out of being entrapped in Gollum's cave for more centuries and yet the ring did not intend for bilbo the one person one of the only few individuals in Arda who could withstand its corruptive power for so long. But right. that means there was another will at force. If the ring didn't will for it to happen, was it Iluvatar? Was it Manwe? Uh, perhaps it was other forces that are beyond our reckoning. And okay. that's where the magic is defined. Two and different Tolkien types. Not, yeah, go, go ahead, please. Yes. No, he, he wasn't even talking about he wasn't trying to name the forces, but the forces are real. I love, I love your picture of the dance. In a yeah. letter that Tolkien wrote to his son, Christopher, when he was serving in World War II in the RAF in South Africa, um, there's, a, there's a really uh, wonderful quote where Tolkien says to him, evil labors with vast power and perpetual success in vain preparing always only the soil for unexpected good to sprout in. Exactly. Well that's said. That's that tension. That's the tension. That's well, right. And, and well said. With Galadriel's, with Galadriel's um, prologue, when she mentions, and then something that the ring did not um, intend happened, is almost, I guess, Peter Jackson and the writers, their way yeah. of saying that it wanted to get out but something else happened instead. It still got out, but I mean, he, cause he didn't really reveal it. I mean, he had it for 60 years and Gandalf was the only one that really knew he had it. Is this a you catastrophe? Something that both bad and good had a play in? The finding of the ring? Yeah. Um, 
it's the it's the setup to it. The catastrophe of the finding of the ring is Bilbo's pity with Gollum. That's right. Oh, but he oh. should have killed Gollum, but he didn't. And so the ownership of the ring began with an act of pity, which ultimately results in the destruction of the ring. Yeah, mm -hmm. because without Gollum, Bill or Frodo would not have given up the ring at at Mount Doom, and Sam would have. Uh, who even knows what would have happened because Sam wouldn't have knocked him over the edge. Um, um, so it had to be do you guys, um, Gollum. Do you guys agree with Cecilia here? As I see it, there is no good magic or bad magic. Yeah, Cecilia, Cecilia Tolkien would agree with you. He was not trying to set up good magic and bad magic. He was he was pointing out, like you did, that it's it's both the intention. Um, well, it's it, it's rooted in intention. And whether it's good magic, ma bad magic, if, if it's what he called magia, sort of um, inherent magic or goy, something or other, uh, it, that is, it's, it's kind of witchcraft or manipulated magic. He wasn't treating any of that as evil. Was, is this about beauty? Is it about furthering um, sort of a providential end? Or is it about control and power? And any mm -hmm. kind of magic could be manipulated in that way yeah. you go to harry potter and you can see similar things going on is this harry using magic or is it voldemort using magic? Yeah. Um, but well, and power, we... power corrupts and, and um or an absolute power corrupts absolutely so that's always the trap um which is why you don't see gandalf using his magic all that often cliff is this is this true gandalf thought it was a lesser magical ring and not an elven ring for a while Yes, initially, yeah. For a while, he thought yeah. that. So the, the, if this is true, this would imply that ring, some of the rings of power will be lesser rings, and they will look like the one well, ring. But there were lots of, in the, especially in the Hobbit, there were lots of different rings. Not all mm -hmm. of them the rings of power that Sauron had. Well, there's had. more magic rings in the 19 constructed yeah. by Sauron. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Experimental yeah. rings. Oh my gosh, you guys. Yeah, this, <laughs> too much magic even, for one, even, for one uh, object. Even, even Professor Tolkien said that Saruman was attempting to learn the craft of yes. Elvin Smith's of Aragion, exactly. and he spent some time tinkering in his back garage, working in the wood shop, trying to make some rings. And so I wonder what those were like, the early prototypes that Saruman yeah. might. I wonder. Yeah. We, we, so we there's, and then there's so, so, and then there's oh, just rings wow. like bar here which is aragorn's ring which comes all the way down the line from thousands of years back and it's not necessarily a magical ring but it's the ring that signifies a certain bloodline um and friendship between elves and men um so you've got that um but um mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So, well, you guys, you guys sold me on on the level of magic at play here, and so this, it this does is big concern. magic. This is this is this is a worthy final four contestant. Magical. Magical. One ring oh, is in the final. And, and, four. and the one last thing, um, Justin, is that when the Hobbit was written, it was just a magical ring of invisibility. Right. He had he had really crafted the rest of the Lord of the Rings, and he hadn't gone back to using. Any of the tropes from the Sigmund <laughs> and um, you know yeah, I, I get know. the ring. I get the ring is magic. I don't argue that. I argue that yeah. just coming across a magic ring is not a magic moment in itself. Well, and and Tolkien, but you, you explain it. That Tolkien yeah. had to go back and rewrite the entire chapter, and had <laughs> when the Hobbit was published post Lord of the, or actually leading up to Lord of the Rings, it was completely revised. Because initially Gollum gave it to, to to Bilbo and said, "Well, you won the Wirtle game, so here's your, here's your ring, here's a prize for you." Out we go. Yeah, he he gave it well, away uh, originally. Yeah. Well, and, and, and oh, what's, Kathy, what's funnier, your microphone. It, I'm going to uh, Kathy. Uh, your microphone is static. Okay. And go ahead and re it reset it. Yeah. Oh dear. Do what? Do do your magic thing. All right. Uh, let, but let's move on to uh, the Fellowship of the Ring so regional week, finals. This was the this was the the region where we have the lower seeds the other ones are all had had pretty top seeds except when we get to the return of the king region um so five and a six but these are really strong fives and sixes gandalf's involved in both of these um one a little more tangentially with the doors of durin 
and figuring out what's the right password for these things. And then, then in this epic, epic battle, uh, which harkens back to first age battles with Glorfindel and the Balrogs. And so there's all kinds of magic and history and lore embedded in the scene on the bridge of Casa mm -hmm. uh, And Yeah, so those are our two matchups here. Yeah, there's no brainer for me, but Kathy, where did you go for on this one? Um, I went with the doors of um, Durin because of, of um, again, it's that reflective, um, you know, the, the, the moonlight shines, you know, let you see the doors. And, and then a magical word has to be spoken. And so obviously someone had to craft that. So it was magic that someone had to craft into the door in order for it to open. Um, and all you had to do was remember the password. <laughs> it's going to be interesting how the, how the TV show, the rumors are that, that the creation of this magic door is going to be seen yeah. in the next season of that Amazon show. But uh, like, like, I don't think we, I don't think we have seen magic put to such use and in such a long-term impact so it's gonna be interesting how how they tackle match. Cliff, who did you vote for on this? Oh, definitely for the Durin's doors opening. Are you kidding me? Am I the Can only one not? that loves Balrogs? Well, no. Hey, that, that's not to disavow my love of a Balrog. Hey, yeah. now I didn't say that. I just yeah. said that there is something so incredibly magical about not just to Maiar spirits fighting against each other sure that's a lot of magic and but but it's the employment it's the employment of the magic the technical <laughs> skill of the door it's a secret password the fact that even such magic passwords can exist open sesame it is a classic trope it's a trope that goes back to a thousand and one arabian nights and Shahrazad. Yep. that's how far tired old, old magic tricks it's tired old lovely, magic trope and it is so unique and delightful the way that tolkien interprets that trope and puts it into his story now that's my answer and, and then he slows everyone down me. okay yeah, and then he slows down everyone because they can't remember the password and they have to keep looking at it and realize it's a riddle and then figure out what the riddle actually means and and so it's just it's just so funny that he's put in this 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 magic that people would have recognized from, you're right, from um, 1001 Arabian Nights. But, um, All right. Uh, so yeah. Speaking for the staff, as we were debating where to place um, this whole Balrog Gandalf scene, um, part of the argument was there are multiple forms of, of magic that are appearing. So you've got Gandalf talking about um, the, the servant of the secret fire and the wielder of the flame of, of Anor. He's He's got... Um, Orcris, not Orcris, it's glamdering in his hand. And it's, you know, it, it is a particular, uh, it's the sword of the high king of Gondolin. And you've got all of the history behind the the, uh, the Balrogs and their whips and their swords. And he's the flame of Udun. So you got the flames working against each other. So there's a lot of, of embedded magic and nuance and detail that's part of that scene as well. Um, in addition to this bridge, that's being built on an over an endless fall, where uh, if anybody happens to drop over the side. And well, I love the uh, music. The music from that fall is just glorious. The 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 starting point to both of these scenes is supposedly going to be in season two, <laughs> Rings of Power. So yeah. Let's see it. But ir irrespective of who voted for yeah, this, yeah. let's see the winner. Who's the winner. It's going to be in Moria, wherever it is. There it is. <laughs> there you go. Now, why did I win and you guys lose on this? What, what what's what's at play here? You know, it, as they say here in the South, you know, even a blind sow finds an occasional acorn. So, eventually, well, and everybody loves Gandalf. <laughs> in fact, Gandalf is going against Gandalf in the next round, so we're about to get some, you know, a lot more, a whole lot more Gandalf coming up soon. Yeah, you're looking you're looking ahead to the finals, but but yeah, into the final four for the Fellowship of the Ring region, we've got a Gandalf. So we got the yeah. one ring and, and, a, and a form of Gandalf have gotten to it. You know, this is obviously a classic scene. Like Cliff said, this is a battle of the Maiars against one another. Uh, one corrupted, one who stayed true, even versus his other mm -hmm. fellow groups. 
So uh, an amazing scene, an amazing display of power, an amazing sacrifice going on because Gandalf yeah. is basically giving himself up so that the fellowship, what remains of it, can press on. Indeed. There's also some wisdom behind uh, a conversation I had with Ian McKellen once about the dialogue, the way the dialogue is presented to his mind. Ian felt that Gandalf was not just saying, I am the servant of the secret fire, blah, 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 blah. All of these yeah. words were part of a spell, a spell yeah. being cast to force the bridge work to break. And we're talking about centuries old dwarven masonry. That yeah. stuff is built to last. Dwarven yeah. masonry, especially the stuff under Moria, is built to last forever and a day. And yeah. yet Gandalf is speaking words about you shall not pass, not just as a command. He thought of it and, and, and as, a, as an actor. I thought it was a really brilliant a, approach. He was mentally yeah. thinking that the words are you shall not pass as if he were casting the fabrication of an yeah. incantation itself to yeah. say this future will not change i'm well, and stopping the light. that future with the magic of saying you will not pass and it's not yeah that happen. sphere of light comes around him as he's speaking these words you know and 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 then he he he, he pounds them on the bridge so you can it's both spoken as well as a physical act um, mm. of when he pounds yeah. the, uh, the staff and the sword on the bridge itself while that that globe is stopping the um the flaming yeah. whip from hitting him yeah. So, yeah the 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 moment when he smashes his staff into the stonework is him casting the final act of the spell and putting the spell yeah. in place right so yeah right. yeah yeah and uh, as far as uh, seeing the movies having not read the books and just when we got to this scene so much had happened already we're like 90 minutes into this movie i've seen magic i've seen i'm watching balrogs and then they kill off a main yeah. character the oh, main dear. character the oh, first dear. the second yeah. character we ever see i just was like oh this is this movie this story this book is really special if they're willing to do that and i think a lot of other shows have tried to to capture that that you know surprise element of like we're gonna kill a main character but this is the one that did it first and did it best. Like, mm -hmm. indeed. What? Right. What? You're gonna Gandalf's gone? No way. And then, of course, the music from Howard Shore, the lament uh -huh. we hear as they exit. Oh, yeah. I mean, it still makes you cry. And all the actors, all the actors, just yeah, played that one to the hilt. So that was yeah. a true uh, ensemble. I love right. what no, no. just said. Unbelievable. On T.D. Matthew just said Gandalf knew he wasn't going to make it. He was sacrificing himself, and he had no knowledge of his resurrection. And I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. I, I think yep. that's why Eru exactly. Eludar resurrected him more powerfully than he ever was, because of the humility of that sacrifice. Yeah. Yep. And that's all um, in that scene. Yeah. Absolutely. And I love the way he retells it. In um, when he runs into the uh, the three in, in in the forest in Fangor's forest, that's just a wonderful way of of explaining how he's gone into an ethereal realm and then put back into a, a mortal realm. But wait, mm -hmm. there's more Gandalf. <laughs> there over it is, right there. In, what I just mentioned. <laughs> yeah, over here in the two tower region finals, it looks yeah. like Gandalf the White against Gandalf the White. Uh, let's get into the distinctions between these moments. Coming back and then, then the power exhibited. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, it's, yeah. how rare, how many instances of pure resurrection happen in all of Arda, in the Silmarillion and Lord of the Rings? Um, once or twice? Twice? I think, uh, Gl was Glorfindel fully resurrected? Yes. And Gandalf the White, I am not able to think of other circumstances. Baron. What about oh, Baron? Baron, yeah. thank you. That's Baron the third Luthien. one. Baron, yeah. But, yeah. but yep. in, in Baron and Luthien's case, they went off and just never interacted again. Mm -hmm. Or Findel does. But it's an interesting yes. thing. Uh, and even a book versus movie kind of a thing. Because book, Glorfindel is the one that finds the wounded Frodo on the path after Weathertop. 
and get and Elrond is thinking, Shh, maybe I ought to send this Thor Findle guy because he's a pretty strong dude. He's right. pretty worth it. But it, interestingly, some would argue, and even Tolkien talked about um, maybe too powerful. Maybe it would be you know, actually draw more attention given the, the resident power of an elf like Lorfindel was so so gigantic. Uh, but he did come back and interacted. It was in the Council of Elrond, but, uh, but not many. You're right. Well, and then, Indeed. of course, with the um, Gandalf healing Theoden, this is an act of, of overt um, magic. I mean, he's like, he's not making any sense. I mean, he's, he's like, I'm doing magic. I am talking to Saruman on the other end, and I am disconnecting these two, and I'm <laughs> casting him out. It was... So different in the books, though. But I will give credit yeah. to the filmmakers for making what they made. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. There's a bit of revealing it when Gandalf the White meets the three hunters and the three runners, um, and then none of their weapons can hurt him, and and Aragorn's sword is flaming and stuff like that. So it's Ga it's Gandalf the White revealed, but in the Gandalf healing Theoden scene. It is it's it's the first real taste of his power that we get, mm -hmm. which is clearly much stronger than Sauron's ever was. It's it's mm -hmm. it's super super Istari has arrived on the on the scene. Yeah, <laughs> and, exactly. And, and I love the, the cinematography of um, you know when Gandalf throws off his gray cloak and reveals himself in this glorious white scene as he's healing um, Theoden. It's it's a remarkable scene. It's Which yeah. point deviates yeah. the most from the books? Um, I would these are both the... actually pretty close. You're you're going to say quick? Oh, I was just going to say. Um, but I, I would instinctually say that number three, the Gandalf healing Theoden, yeah. is you know as T D Matthew also identifies in the chat that it wasn't an exorcism but a rekindling of hope and a rekindling yeah. of the heart. Which is what was going on, so it was different. Yeah. Yeah. Good, uh, good, good point. Let's see who wins. Gandalf is the winner. Gandalf uh, is the winner. <laughs> so yeah. this will be funny. The slow motion return of Gandalf the White from the dead. Sixty-seven percent of the votes, kids. So this is going to be on the other side of. So you've got Gandalf the Gray going up against. The Gandalf gray. the Grey is going to go up against Gandalf the White. Well, before we oh, get dear. to that, I just want to say on, okay. on, on this scene, Gandalf the White, uh, this felt the most, out of everything in the movies, this felt the most not. Uh, it felt the most out of place. Like, you know, when when, when they do that 2001 A Space Odyssey through That's time exactly and space. That's exactly what I was thinking when I saw it too, Justin. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 it's, what? it's I love it. I think it's like, great. Did you? I, I, I yeah, it doesn't it feel right. It doesn't feel right to the rest of the movie. Is that, but is that a good visual framework that these other shows that will, that will start exploring the creation myths and maybe the flattening of the world or the rounding of the world? Is this a good place to start? When talking about those astrophysical uh, well, you're things, supposed to get, yeah, you're supposed to feel like he's outside of the world at that yes. point. After the fall yes. and after the fight with him, he's supposed to be outside, and then he was sent back. So it is supposed to look otherworldly. It's not Middle Earth um, for that time, Ooh. this time frame right here. He's not in Middle Earth. That at that point. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. What, what's All happened? Right. Think of it as nested bowls or nested orbs. There's Middle Earth. It's this Earth. It's it's an orb, and you can't get to the Undying Lands, which is where the Elves live. That's only approachable via straight line, where you have to leave the Earth. But it's still in the created order that Eru Iluvatar has made. When you see this scene, like Kathy yes. said, it is leaving all of that and going out to the Void area where Melkor is chained up. It's going out to where the flame of Anor presumably exists somewhere because Eru Iluvatar made it. So kind of like, as you said, Justin, 2001, there is an idea of leaving existence as we know it 
and that's what Gandalf has left, not expecting to come back. And yet, he basically, Eru Ulupatar says, good job. I, you got work left to do against Sauron. So I'm sending mm -hmm, you back mm -hmm. in, in the I'm white. Not dead. Yeah. So that's what's happening. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> yes. Well, All no, right. Moving that's on. Our, that's our last. No, that's our last. last two so, towers. So, so far, we've got two Gandalf and one one ring. Mm -hmm. Now we have this. We've got a witch king falling to no man. And Rohan arriving in the nick of time. We talked in past shows about all yes. of the circumstances and alignments and Gonbury gone and just only one of these is magic, according to my book. Only one of them is magic, and you have not convinced me yet that the rooster crowing. I'm still not sold that there's any magic at play. It's the secret paths. Those are the magic. So. Look, what? What are you gonna say? it is the greatest <laughs> it is the greatest moment of arrival at the most providential, divinely inspired and most needful, the most needful time. What's not magic about that? Uh, good strategic yeah. military planning is just <laughs> good strategic military planning, my friend. Remember, magic <laughs> exists in Middle Earth and it sometimes comes into play. Um, and it, but, it, this is a little bit more Celtic where um, um, there are ways to get from point A to point B and not all of them are the ways that mortals can take. Um, and and um, that if you're not supposed to be there, you will never find it because you will be turned aside. You will led, be led astray. And this is that's a very Celtic magic. Mm -hmm. um, so, Dave, Dave Tim uh, bring, brings up an interesting thing. Both of these are Rohanian, which is uh, an interesting uh, turn of phrase I hadn't considered before. Uh, it. it also brings up <laughs> the, I, the idea that I guess I never really considered that the ending of Return of the King is mostly just Rohan versus Sauron. Like Gondor is being defended, but they're the actual like a lot of the energy Tolkien spends is on the men of Rohan uh, doing the thing and the women of Rohan saving the day. Like, this is Rohan versus Sauron or Rohan versus Mordor, not, not necessarily Gondor. Like, Gondor's been decimated by this point. Am I, well, like, you know, and in that sense, both of these scenes are alike because, like Theoden says, uh, you know. We don't have enough men, says um, um, who? Glambry? No, not um, Gamlin. Says to, to Theoden, and yet we will still fight. Um, yeah. We will fight nonetheless. So, so Rohan arriving on the scene against the forces arrayed to them, um, we're not going to win that battle. If anything, you could argue that the magic of the the um, King of the Dead and the Army of the Dead overtaking the Corsairs. And then all of the South Gondorians arriving in the ships when Sauron's army thought that it was going to be a bunch of allies, it was a bunch of enemies. You know, that actually turned the tide, really, of the battle. Uh, but it's an impossible situation. There is no way that Eowyn, with Mary as, as her backup, is going to beat that witch king. You know that. There's no way that, you know, as, as wonderful as the Zorhir are, it's a hopeless battle. And do you think that turn? Uh, this brings up the question: War of the Rohirrim feature film coming out this December in theaters worldwide. Would it actually be good, or maybe not a great idea, if there's some poetic allusion to in this prequel of Rohan, War of the Rohirrim, of a shield man? Oh yeah, making that fatal blow. Oh, I don't know about the fatal blow, but they're definitely we're going to see shield maidens. Maybe we're definitely going to see shield maidens. But do you think there's going to be like a, you know a poetic rhyming uh, hmm. of of something in this prequel where a shield maiden kills the big foe in a similar way? Would that be a good thing, yeah, or would it lessen this moment? Well, I, I hmm. think what would be great is because it's going to depend on who the foes are and if. The images of Mumakil and and the Southern and Herodrim 
is accurate, it's mostly people. Um, and less, you know, and the Dunlenders, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, who, who are they fighting? Um, because the only equal would be if they were fighting an orc or, or something else that, uh, that, you know, as opposed to just a human, another human, because then it would just be a human fighting a human. So it's going to depend if you, if you want, like, kind of like a parallel of if the big bad is either magical or one of these other races. Um, otherwise, again, it's just people fighting people. Um, it's just that they are considered the equals. You know, so maybe you just see them. It's like they might be the last stand at some battle where it's just like, oh, the shield maidens are here. We're saved. So I Interesting, don't know. a comment from Daisy Kim, TD Matthew, Otaku Senpai. Uh, the whole chat room is basically saying, in the books... Aragorn brings uh, more armies of Gondor. It's yes. not just mm -hmm. the undead. And and Including Peter Jackson Prince made a choice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Jackson loves his zombies, and yeah. you know, and he needed a quick <laughs> battle. And so we needed a quick win. So green swarming dead. zombies. We we we. I actually call them the scrubbing bubbles. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> well, particularly when you start to see them go after the Oliphant. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never think of them the same way again. They clean and scrub Minas Tirith like scrubbing bubbles yeah. on your porcelain sink. But the thing and, is, and that why did why why would have Peter Jackson have to deal with introducing Prince Imrahil and all these other characters that we love in Lord of the Rings and the pages of the Lord of the Rings? They don't mm -hmm. get screen. That happens to Glorfindel, happens to Erkenbrand. It certainly yeah. happens to Imrahil. It happens to other characters in Minas Tirith. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, what, yeah. Baragond, for one, right? Well, so, geez, they should all team up and be like the uh, suicide least, squad of, of, of Middle Earth. I never got <laughs> bothered for crying out loud. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, should we I reveal the, the final winner going into the final last, four? The last member of our final four is coming up. Yay! Wow. Yay! Wow. Yay! The Witch King's death the Witch King by falls. prophecy and, and command, providential command. Wow. And can I just say that that um, um, when I went to see the movie the first time, and and when she chopped off that the the, the head of the fell beast, yeah. I literally jumped out of my seat screaming. I, I kid you not. <laughs> Luckily, I was in the back row, so I didn't have to worry about people throwing popcorn at me. But I jumped out of my seat. <laughs> and then, instead of watching this battle, that's when the ships show up, Aragorn, the ghost mm -hmm. army. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then they go back to this. And I'm like going, why? She was on this crescendo. She was on this path. And you stopped it. Why? Um, so I always sort of was a little offended that they sort of cut her, her bravery into two <laughs> sections. Um, yeah, but know, it was it, what a victory to Aragorn. Yeah. Because taking place. out the Witch King, you know, would have freaked out all the other Nazgul. So, whatever. That was my gripe. Mm. That was my only gripe, at least for this okay. movie. I understand the decisions, but yeah, I, I also feel like it would have felt like the first ending. It would have added another ending rather than a, a major beat in this big battle it would have felt like the ending of the battle and maybe the first of the endings. I don't know. It's yeah. uh mm. Yeah. There are pros I, and cons to it, but uh, this is a strong matchup. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So there's our, there's our fan wow. or, or radiant four. So we uh, only get the two Gandalfs if, if they make it to the, to the final. Correct. correct. Wow. So it's, it's Gandalf the gray and the Balrog going up against what we just talked about, the Witch King falling to no man, versus yeah. Gandalf the White going up against the One Ring. These are powerful, powerful Final Four magic Both, we have both two, are one, battle two, moments two, versus wow. serendipity moments. Yeah. I, yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, so you got <laughs> the quiet of the, uh, of the left-hand side, the One Ring finding and the, and the Gandalf appearing and resurrecting. Versus these huge battle moments. You're right. We could see a Gandalf versus Gandalf final. Um, we could be a one ring, ring you know, Eowyn. you know, Aj Nazg Durbatuluk. One <laughs> ring to rule them all for any of those who are rooting for the one ring. Could make a all chat room. Way. You don't have to tell us uh, who you're voting for yet, but just tell us yes or no. Is Are you decided 
or no, this is challenging and I'm going to have to think about this. I want to, yes, if you're already decided this is an easy, easy vote or no, we need to do some convincing real quick. Because hmm. <laughs> uh, I know who I'm voting for in both matches. Well, well. <laughs> well. <laughs> uh, I'm going for Alan, well, I did, man. Alan, Alan, I, Alan. I, I, I did include on here, by the way, the popular vote. So we can track not oh, only oh. how their matchups are doing, but the total yeah. raw vote in this round. Um, yeah. And our number one popular vote getter was the, the Balrog battle. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe yeah, it was because. Yep. What, that what is that so was. magic. <laughs> Guys, it, that is the most magic of all four of these. The ba wizard versus a Balrog? That is magic to my eyes. <laughs> Gan Alpha White's number two. Aowen and Mary against the Witch King is three. And our one ring is still, is was, it was a closer matchup in The Hobbit. Um, yeah. Region. It's interesting that the destruction of the ring didn't make it, but the yeah. wonderful discovery of the ring made it. That's yeah. really I, an eye opener to me. Yeah. Well, yeah. based on the chat room, a lot of people are going to be voting for Aowen. I'm uh, uh, Aowen. so. Uh, I, I, yeah. Uh, I have to. We've got uh, that movie to... rolling out. We've got that movie rolling out. So you yeah, know, you've got you've got a spinoff, whatever. You know, uh, we didn't see much of the Balrog in 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 the per, in the other prequel. So uh, I don't know. A woman versus an ancient evil. Uh, there's just something magic about two Maiar. Also, learning after the fact, years later, through this community. That Gandalf mm -hmm. and Balrog are like both Maiar and they're both equal spirits. I'm like, wait, what? Like yeah. this, mm -hmm. this is operating on a whole nother level. If this was like a matchup of equals, uh, that's magic. I, I like, like everything about that battle of Ka Bridge of Casa Doom is so magic. And the more you learn about everything going on in Casa Doom, the more magic it becomes. I guess you could say that about the Aowen battle too. Um, <laughs> well, on the so, fact that Mary played a part, and, and and again, of course, in the book, like I said before, um, Mary didn't know it was Aowen until this moment when she speaks. Yeah, it was during and home. Sudden, it was during and, that's what, yeah. and and yeah. that was what um, spurred him to move because the the the, the Nazgul um, emanate fear. Um, make everyone around them cower, and and Mary was in a little ball until he heard her voice, and that's what. And he finally said, "She's gonna die. I can't let her die alone," and that's why he stabs, you know, stabs him in the back of the leg, um, and you know, helps <laughs> in, right. in that fight. Well, so uh, yeah, so it it kind of built. I mean, you you have to read that scene to see how it's built. Um, it's just yeah. it's so cool that. I mean, it was such a great surprise, and God, I hope I didn't just spoil it for somebody out there who hasn't read the book yet. <laughs> uh, Jim, do you, uh, uh, without giving an opinion, uh, yeah. based on voting history, do you have yeah. any inclination of which of both of these matchups, which I, one is probably going to get the more votes, just um, offhand? And you're seeing some of the folks, you know, we, we've got some people saying, oh, I know who I'm voting for, and I'm probably going to lose in both of the matchups. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe not. It's been interesting to watch the voting because some of them have, have not been close. We had one two thirds vote in this in this uh, round of um, eight, um, but some of them have been literally within four votes of one another, uh, and that could be the case here. Um, you know, the the A one scene is so popular and so in appropriately ennobling and empowering for so many. There is such a, an affection for that scene. Yes. Um, yeah. But the Meyer on Meyer thing, oh, and, and in the Aowen scene, please don't miss the fact that, um, and, and I was glad that I was able to find the gif of the Mary stab because in literally the movie, it forces the witch king to drop to his knees so that Aowen can even stab him in the face. Otherwise, this is yeah. going to be a, a problem. But, but the fact that Mary in the book is wielding a spell laced um, sword of um, the Numenor um, mm -hmm. 
is is yeah. material to the dis oh, yeah. the disintegration of of the witch king. And so it was a coup de grace that Aowen is able to deliver. Otherwise, it's back to the Justin point of it's just sure it's a woman, great, but it's just a sword getting stuck into a guy's head. What's magic about that? So there is real magic that's going on yeah. through that scene. So I, I think that that will be a very tight battle. That 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 uh, right hand. So share the voting sure. link when we post yes. it. Share the voting link. Tell all your friends to vote if you if you want Aowen to vote. The it, it the the shoes aren't in. Um, the the results can go either way if you mm -hmm. share it across all your shoulder uh, uh, all all your socials and tell people how to vote. Like there's no rules. It, it's a Middle Earth. March Madness voting contest. So it is what's magic off, to you. It is what's stuff magic. Stuff the you. ballots. Stuff those ballots in as many, create as many accounts as possible. But before we, but we before we move on, uh, I am more curious to hear from this panel who you're voting for on the Western uh, Conference Finals here. Because as you know, I've said that Bilbo finding the ring just isn't magic, but you guys have a strong argument. Yeah. Gandalf yeah. coming back to life, that's really magic. So yeah. Yeah. where are you guys leaning in that Western Conference final? Yeah. <laughs> I think Gandalf the White is going to be really strong. He has been Is there any now. reason that Bilbo should win? The ring should win? Is it's there any win. reason that you can it's give? It's one freaking ring, for crying out loud. Yeah. Yeah, but Gandalf yeah. was the very first champ of our very first Middle Earth March Madness. So, because he's he was... a strong, he's a strong character. He come back to life, oh, yeah. so he's that strong. But, uh, but there's look. a lot of magic. I guess what I'm trying to get get you guys to talk about is that this is called magical moments, and you guys claim that there's a ton of magic and prophecy at play in yes. number two. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There is. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Indeed. In our Hobbit, in our Hobbit finals. Yeah. So, yeah. is that more magic than Eru Iluvatar sending the wizard back? That's not magic. That's god power. See. <laughs> Sorry. See? This Sorry. is magical moments. Let's talk magic. <laughs> you know, the the is 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 divine providence magic. Depends well, yeah. upon so, how you <laughs> feel about it, how you culturally look at that act of divine providence. It really depends. And I have no problem at all with a pre, you know, like a Bronze Age culture, this imaginary culture in the Third Age of Middle Earth, embracing divine properties as magic properties. I have no, I mean, anthropologically speaking, I've got no problem with it at all. So kind of by <laughs> definition, um, magical power is power that is operating in ways that are beyond the realm of nature yep which makes it super natural mm -hmm. and exactly. if that's the case then god power is super natural on the biggest so, scale on the biggest yes. scale <laughs> so yeah. so yeah all of this stuff so you and, and th these are wonderful finalists because they're all threaded with so many of the important themes that, yeah. that Tolkien was writing about and that are fascinating to us as story and that are so meaningful us, for us just as humans as we resonate with these kinds of scenes. You know, mm -hmm. begin with the ennoblement of the humble in face of overwhelming odds, whether it's mm -hmm. Gandalf against the Balrog or Eowyn against the Witch King oh, um, yeah. or even Bilbo against that ring. So, yeah. Do do you guys agree with Daisy Kim here that says we think Eru is involved in both of those moments, Bilbo finding the ring and Gandalf returning? Sure. Oh, absolutely. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yep. Um, well, and I I, I, yeah. No, go ahead. But uh, Eowyn, you, you got to understand, mm, hobbits yeah. and, and elves and, and men, women are creations not of any of the Valar. They were a surprise by Eru Iluvatar. They are the children of Iluvatar, not the children of, of Manwe or the children of Yabana or the children of whomever. Mm -hmm. um, and so they are, they are, as far as anybody knows, 
inside the system, the wild card that's come from outside the system. That's what's so magical about the, Tolkien's whole theology of death. What does it mean? Is he saying that it's a gift to men? That doesn't mm -hmm. sound right. It certainly didn't sound right to the Numenorians, and yet, so all of this stuff is at work in, in, in even in our finalists. So that's a wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. My 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 final uh, thumb on the scale is this <laughs> this franchise this book series is called The Lord of the Rings. Yeah. This website is called theonering.net. Uh there's I'm only the one option family. here with the <laughs> ring. There's only one ring in one of these options here, yeah. and that's yeah. the right one. The one <laughs> ring should there win. Is, the there is another ring. Gandalf has a ring at this point. Well, he does. There's a yeah, no, he doesn't. He's dead. How would he? How would he come back to life with the same ring? He like, like is that ever explained? Is that a Actually, loophole? The, the the ring, the ring of fire, was probably very, very helpful in Gandalf's confrontation at the Bridge of Khazad-dûm against the Balrog. Yes. Yeah. But in terms of cinema, Peter Jackson was remarkably careful in terms of continuity to not even reveal Narya until after the destruction of the One Ring. And you're at the Grey Havens, and yeah. you'll notice the Ring of Fire very prominently on Gandalf's hand. But the you three didn't rings see are films leaving films before, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Well, yep, yep, I never yep. saw it before. I still think the ring should have a chance <laughs> at <laughs> the championship. And number two here, here, here. is the only ring <laughs> at play. And Eowyn. Final, okay. And Eowyn. That's my final thing. All right. Uh, so well, that's your final four, four folks. As passionate as you about their choices, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's your final four, folks. Uh, we are almost there. Um what is uh what's the dates for voting here? How, how yeah, are we playing this? Yeah, they're on here and they were on the last time. Yeah, so so you've got from uh, tomorrow. Actually, you'll be able to begin voting now. Um, the uh, the one ring .net website is is probably posted already. An article of, with these results, and you'll find the the voting links there. So you can start voting now through the um, the sixth, and then at next Torn Tuesday, yeah. on the ninth. Um, the plan is to reveal the winner. So we'll have one other round. We'll get through to the finalists between now Lovely. and next week. And then next and Tuesday. I will be I will be voting from a ship on my way to Mazatlan to see the eclipse. <laughs> well, there you go. Out of out of oh, curiosity, awesome. um, and it's something you guys might you guys know maybe, is obviously the mm -hmm. moon plays a big part in a lot of the magic and a lot of the um scenes and sequences within middle earth um it's often mentioned but do other things like comets or eclipses ever get mentioned anywhere in the silmarillion and and anywhere in middle earth i i i don't recall hmm. any kind of celestial um things other than occasionally seeing the stars well, and that's cer about certainly it. constellations do and there yeah. are correlates yeah. to our constellations but yeah. the moon as you said was very important in aligning the stories. In fact, Tolkien had to go back and, you know, make them take more time so that his moon uh, shapes would align correctly. So he's very yeah. good. I don't think eclipses or comets come in. Right. Yeah. Might, no, all, all of the wizards are sent to Earth via comet. Like, Com we all saw yeah. this. Stop that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and of course, if I remember correctly, one of people's uh, many favorite scenes of hope is when Sam and Frodo are in Mordor and you know there's that great cloud covering for the orcs but there's a little clearing and a bright star and it gives Sam hope. Yes. Wait, and, did and, it, and uh, it's a lovely Didn't uh, the Harfoot say that their ancestors become stars? I don't remember. And I wouldn't treat that as canon, but that's No, I don't recall that either. But okay, <laughs> I, I, I thought I remember a bunch of a bunch of book lore nerds getting excited that the Harfoot said that because it was an a allusion to another thing in the can book canon, where someone became a star. Oh, Arendelle, no? but, but but that's he's not a Harfoot. That's that that doesn't have anything to do with the Harfoots, but yeah, Arendelle. Well, Arendelle Arend well, yeah. isn't that Elrond? That's Elrond's father. Yeah. Yeah. And he's yeah. not really a star, he's a planet. But 
That's right. What? Venus. What? What? Like Venus ego? The morning star. Yeah. No, he's, he's, like, he's got a Silmarillion. The, the Silmaril yeah. is is the morning star or the evening star, which in our universe is Venus. It's the Wait, brightest so thing in the night sky. Elrond's dad becomes Kurt Russell. Yeah, no. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is why I only get one so vote, funny. and you guys online get all the votes He's that you so need and want to get yours to the winner. The final four starts voting, I guess, right now, goes Indeed. through the end of Friday, if I look at my calendar. And then on Friday, we'll tally up the votes, and then you'll have the rest of the weekend to vote for the national championship for the 2024 Middle Earth March Madness, the most magical moment. Magical moment, remember, this theme. And then next Tuesday, we will announce the big winner. So, yeah, you get the vote, you get the vote through Saturday, Justin. T Saturday the 6th, and then Sunday, Monday, Tuesday is when you'll vote for the champion. Yep. Well... This is so That's exciting. Something. Yeah. Um, this has been rather well, invigorating, hasn't it? It's been really great. Yeah. It, well, it's and, kind and, of fun because there's so many cool magical moments. I mean, there's like the really silly ones like the talking purse and <laughs> and then the really like I'm going to fight a Balrog, you know, real real hardcore serious um um bits of magic. So um Yeah. It's nice, but we've know. had such invigorating conversation about thematic approach the author's intention and what the author accomplished um, and our own ideas from different points of view about what constitutes magic and, and just the way that Tolkien presents softer and hard magic in different you know, spots of his story. This has been very intellectually uh, uh, good. It's been enlightening, really. And I've learned a lot really? talking to everybody about this. It's pretty cool. Well, well before and, and, Cliff... And, and, and I, I was just going to mention, and this is kind of going back to the ring again, um, and and the mm. fact that you know Bilbo finding an inv a ring of invisibility is. Um, I had a friend who, um, in like junior high school, she was doing a book report on The Hobbit, and when she got her paper back, she had gotten an F, and she asked the teacher, she goes, "How did I get this wrong?" And and the teacher says, "Well, this didn't happen, and this this is wrong, and this is wrong." So she opens up her book and he says, but it says that right here. And the teacher kind of closed the cover and looked on the inside page and went, oh, you're going to want to take this home and give it to your mom and tell her to lock it up. It's a first edition. So she had a first edition where it was just a magical ring. And so Gollum was just a creepy character. And, and and stuff like that and she had no idea and her mom was like yeah here you know you're you're studying it go take this oh yeah <laughs> that's so, hilarious um, that's you, you yeah, can yeah. Actually buy a replica of that same edition now you have yeah. To look for it. yeah that's in oh, that, so you can that get is a great a version story. so you can you get can. a version of the original text oh that'd you, be you so can get cool a similarly of the original yeah Oh, that would um, be awesome. And, all right. But before uh, before Cliff takes us out, I just, I finally found it. It took me the whole show. Oh, uh, good. Let me bring yeah. this maxing up full That's size. Great. This is the WonderCon Masquerade winners of the 14 person Lord of the Rings. Look at this. These folks won the WonderCon Masquerade 20 years. 20 Best in show. Years after Return of the King won all the Oscars. The best in show at the WonderCon Masquerade. And look at the hobbits. Look how small they actually all are. They're actually um, young people. And so that wow. there's no, you know, you've got your, your adult characters behind them. It's just, it's hilarious. I mean, you know, and I saw Perfect. some of these people. And I, I wish I'd gone to the thing, but I was just like, I'm going to go chill. I was hoping to watch a hockey game, but whatever. <laughs> That's incredible. And I that love the, the Tower image. of Sauron. The Eye of Sauron yeah. is there. What, yeah. what, what a wonderful thing. And then and then real quick before uh, before Cliff takes us out, programming note, tomorrow night at uh, 6 p.m. I don't know if that's my time or Eastern time. Uh, you can go to Nerd of the Rings for a first look at the brand new sandbox mode in the Return to Moria. Yes, a video game about dwarven building and digging is getting its first major so game update i think i don't know if this is version 2 or version 1.5 but we are doing a exclusive first look um and all the developers of the game are going to be in the chat to answer your questions so that's going to be tomorrow night 
at Nerd of the Wings. In fact, as we sit here now, 11 people are waiting in that chat room for it to start. So I won't be watching Torn Tuesday. I have no idea. Uh, that's brilliant. That's nice. There you go. Not, not like Hall H people. You don't have to get in line the two days before. That's brilliant. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, for another gonna have, wonderful. Do you think we're going to have two big panels? Do you think we're going to have both a big Rings of Power Season 2 and a big War of the Rohirrim panel at Comic-Con? They aren't combining, I can tell you that. Well, no, they're not combining. No, I mean, two. That's why I call them two panels, not one. Not us, them. You know, in other words, are we going yeah, to have to go to Hall H twice? Hmm. There, mm. is, there is a chance. Mm. There is a chance, but we don't know anything for sure we don't until know. they announce it. So, Comic Con's going to be a big Lord of the Rings presence. You've got Tales of the Shire coming out a month later. You've got potentially uh, Rings of Power coming out pretty soon after that. And then you've got War of the Rohirrim. This is the big Comic-Con before Ro War of the Rohirrim comes out in December, as a Lord of the Rings movie should. So uh, I expect a lot of uh, wonderful fan activations. And of course, Torn will be there as and well. I would love to get at least a few character. I mean, I, and I know Cliff was talking about this at, at WonderCon was we want some character images before Comic-Con so that it character gives designs. cosplayers a chance to show up. Yeah, I mean, it Wouldn't would be great. Be great? Some, yeah, yeah, studios, if you're watching, <laughs> cosplayers need some time. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Cosplayers yeah. need some time. Just, we, just, we got fans that are ready to dress up for you, but you got to give us the goods. Yeah, do. A week doesn't cut it. A week doesn't cut it. you, you got to no. give us at least a month. A week, a month doesn't Jeez. cut it. Like, you yeah. need to start releasing stuff right now of your characters. And not not just close-up hand posters. And That's not right. just, like, far away, like, <laughs> tiny little cool anime dresses, figures cool color, on a giant cool watercolor. Yeah, we need, <laughs> we need great photos. We do. We're ready to cosplay. Front and Remember back, that Front and black. <laughs> this year... For 2024, San Diego Comic Con will be from Thursday, July 25th, all the way through to Sunday, July 28th. That is the last weekend of July this summer, so it's coming up right around the corner. It really is. Yep. yep. So everybody, get right. ready. Wednesday's preview night. Wednesday's preview that's, night. That's right. It sure is. All right. Before we leave, um, one of the most magical things that happened for us at the One Ring.net was getting a chance to be reunited with our friend and illustrator and multiple Eisner Award winner, Colleen Doran. She has uh, gone through a health scare, a significant health scare, if you follow yeah. her on Facebook and social media, and she's recovered. And as the British would say, I'm quite happy to report she's on the mend. And she is quite on the mend. And as she was there at WonderCon doing big personal appearances and uh, autograph signings for everybody, she was always willing to talk about how much she loves Viggo Mortensen as Aragorn. And we never get tired of, you know, giggling and laughing and talking about how <laughs> amazing Viggo was as yep. Aragorn. You know, just you could live and die on that thread. And you could actually hang, you could hang an entire nation on that thread of faith in Aragorn, to borrow a quote from the TV show. But this was the one thing that we got our hands on. It is chivalry. This hardcover, beautiful graphic novel that was written by Neil Gaiman and is now published by Dark Horse. Dark Horse Comics has this imprint. Chivalry is the remarkably sweet and adroit little story about a wonderful little old lady who discovers the Holy Grail quite by accident in an Oxfam <laughs> uh, <laughs> thrift shop hidden underneath a raggedy old fur coat. And she finds the real Holy Grail. And it isn't long before a dashing knight in shining armor appears at her cottage door trying to persuade her to give up the Holy Cup. And it's such an amazing story. It's filled with unbelievable watercolors and illustrations. And the more I look at it, the more I think we should get Colleen to do a J.R.R. Tolkien calendar. Imagine oh. her doing all these amazing illustrations oh, yeah. all year oh, yeah. long. Imagine just falling into the images. So get your hands on Chivalry. You'll love it. It's only $20. It's amazing. 
And before mm-hmm. I Dark Horse I is owned by Embracer. Uh, oh, hello. That is a connection. The Embracer Group also purchased Dark Horse Comics. Uh, look at this. It has zero artificial intelligence images in it, too. Look at that. that yeah, no that is all images. original human you know artwork. It actually says adaptation art and illuminated manuscript pages. She has pages in here that look like from the 1400s, the 1300s, where they would illustrate oh. beautiful, ornate pages. And she signed She does for amazing histor- historical oh. studies of artwork so she can. Absolutely. Yeah, she she yeah, truly so, is. Some of her artwork is just bonkers. And, you know, you're going to have a great time with it. If you love fantasy and, you know, Anglo-centric fantasy, like we often do, then pick up Chivalry. You will love it. And now here's the thing. We sign off with congratulations to Jim uh, and the team uh, volunteering at thewondering.net for putting so much effort into our Middle Earth March Madness. It's been a great time. And it has led to some very invigorating and imaginative conversations with you and all of our friends on social media. So find us at thewondering.net on your web browser. Follow us on our Discord. It's a wild and wonderful place where we get to talk and share posts and analyze. And of course, there's Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and all the other things in between. Follow us at thewondering.net. I myself, yes? I'm just gonna mention, uh, I'm gonna mention Janice Gordon, just wrote oh hello there's Facebook. janice gordon in oh the my chat. god yes i'm an old lady 61 in england and tomorrow morning i'm headed straight to oxfam thanks go for the straight, heads up <laughs> go straight to the thrift store and find the holy grail there please oh okay. yeah that's awesome it's, janice. it's underneath an old tattered fur coat in this boring little oxfam place it's hilarious you're gonna it's hilarious it's a charming story all right so before we before we go and say good night i want to encourage you guys to follow me quick bean 2000 on instagram and twitter and we'll see you here right here like clockwork next friday at 5 p.m pacific time for another delightful episode of torn tuesday my dear janice have a safe trip um across the pond have a lovely time and uh visit the henge while you're there stonehenge have a really good trip and um i i love you guys thanks for being part of the show Justin, tip of the hat to you, producer and good sir. Kathy and Jim, my wonderful staffers, thank you for being with us. Until next week, as we love to say, good night and good luck. Or better yet, buenos noches y buena suerte. Bye, everybody. <laughs>